Hello, and this week we are looking at the ecology of human performance in applied occupational theory. I'm Brenda Howard. This week we're going to be talking about how ecology or the relationship between organisms and their environment are important when it comes to considering occupation based interventions. And we're especially going to be considering population level interventions this week. And that's going to help us think about how can occupational therapists influence all of society in addition to individual clients. A little bit about the history of ecology of human performance. You might recognize the name of Winnie Dunn because she is also one of the major theorists in regard to sensory integration. So uh, she and a couple of colleagues at the University of Kansas in 1994 decided to develop this new model. And the reason they were writing this model is because they didn't feel that the other occupation-based models available at the time were clear enough on the substantial influence that context and environment have on an individual in their occupational performance. So they wanted to address that and also expand upon it. Not only that, but remember how we said most of our occupation-based models are written by occupational therapists for occupational therapists. Well, this one was written by occupational therapists for the interprofessional team. So this one was specifically written to use terms that could be more broadly understood by a large number of people, especially folks from the social science realm. But what do we mean by the word ecology? As I said earlier, ecology is those interrelationships between organisms and their environments. So this is specifically in this case, we're looking at the relationships that humans have with their context, how the humans influence their context, how the context influence the humans, and also the effects on occupational performance that occur as a result. Now the context in this particular model is divided into four aspects, some of which will seem familiar to you, physical, temporal, social, and cultural. Now the temporal is one that might uh, merit some definition here, because in this case they're talking about temporal both as what's going on inside the person, the person's specific age, uh, their maturity level, their um, uh, you know, time of life, uh, what's going on in their life at that period of time. But it also might have to do with the temporal aspects of the occupation. How long does it take to do this occupation? What's the endurance that's required for it? Uh, what's the, what are some of the shorter segments of it and how can it be carried over a longer period of time? So anything that has to do with what we will call personal context or environmental context can also be included in that temporal aspect. So here are the four main constructs of the model. We've already touched on the context. The person is very simply defined as skills and abilities and including the sensory, motor, cognitive, and psychosocial aspects. Notice how you don't see the word occupation in this model. Instead, the authors use the word task to talk about the things people do uh, that accomplish a goal. So in this case, there is no nested concept of task, activity, and occupation, or whatever order other models put that in. There's just task. And the reason they chose that instead of occupation was that it would be more universally recognized by a variety of professions. The final construct on this page is performance range. Performance range. Now, performance range is the number and types of tasks that are available to the person. This performance range can base that change based on environmental constraints or based on constraints going on within the person or even constraints of the task. So that performance range varies during the amount of time that the person is performing the occupation throughout their lifespan. So in that way, this model is similar mm -hmm to the uh, PEO model in considering the person, environment, and context as being transactive and in a constant state of change and growing and developing over time. 
Those are uh, similar concepts in both of these models. So here is how uh, the model is depicted, and this is the only picture that's given in our textbook. However, the original article, uh, it has a lot more pictures, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later on. But here we see those four constructs represented. The person is surrounded by their context, and that context can be their own personal context or things going on in their environment. But in this case, in particular, we're looking at how is the environment facilitating their ability to engage in those tasks. So there are an infinite number of tasks available to the person, and the model depicts the person looking through their context at the available tasks and considering what performance is available to them. Now, as part of that, this model has the term performance range. The performance range are the amount and types of tasks available to the person based on their own skills and abilities and the supports of the context that are around them. So this performance range can grow and shrink based on the environment and on the person's skills and abilities. Now, one other concept we need to mention here is the idea of roles. And in this particular model, roles are task clusters. So these are clusters of tasks that can overlap, uh, indicating what, um, you know, a particular task that might be part of uh, one role, but also part of another role. So for example, gardening, I might consider that to be part of my role as a home maintainer, but I also might consider it to be part of my role of being, um, say, a wife and mother who spends time with her family um, in the yard working on things together. So kind of a shared, um, it could be, you could consider it as a, as a job to do or even as a leisure activity. So that same task of gardening can be placed into one role or another. And so those roles can overlap in the tasks that they require. Just a different way to think about tasks and how they are a part of the various roles that we have as individuals. So let's talk about a few key concepts and definition. We mentioned this performance range, and we talked about how it's the number and tasks available to the person, but it's based on this transaction that's constantly going on. There are times when the environment provides more supports, and there are times when it provides less supports. So for example, Maybe my skills and abilities haven't changed, but maybe I moved to an apartment. Well, there is not as much opportunity for gardening in an apartment as there is in a house that has a large backyard. So there um, is a limitation there, not based on my skills and abilities, but based on the environment. But you could also say, what if the person has something happened to them? Let's say I broke my arm. Uh, temporarily, I would be unable to engage in the uh, task of gardening, not because the environment had changed, but because the person characteristics had changed. So we have to think of this constant transaction that's going on between the environment and the person that either expands or limits the number of tasks available to the person or the performance range. Now here's another key term. This one is not in your textbook. This is called transactional contextualism. Think of this more as happening over the long term, over a lifespan of a person. So transactional contextualism is that the person affects and is affected by their environment. And there's a sense in which the person is getting an identity, constructing oneself in context. And this concept is very similar to Moho's concept of occupational identity. Okay, so there's kind of a, a similarity or a bridge there, even though they come at very different places in the model. So this transactional contextualism says that I am going to shape my occupations um, based on the environment that I'm in. So for example, I grew up in Indiana where the land is flat and where you have to have a lot of money and time to go elsewhere to learn how to downhill ski. And since I grew up in a um, kind of middle class family that, that didn't really uh, value flying to Colorado in the wintertime or, you know, in, in the other seasons that you can downhill ski, um, obviously you can tell I didn't learn to downhill ski and I don't know that much about it. 
um, you know, didn't grow up near mountains, haven't had that experience. So if I changed my context, let's say when I was um, a young adult, I moved to Colorado and all my friends were downhill skiing. So there's an aspect of the social context. The mountains were nearby. So there's this beautiful outdoor physical space that I might like to enjoy. I might have taken up downhill skiing and eventually I would have began to see myself in the light of being someone who skis, which then constructs myself in context. Okay, so the context, the availability or not of a particular activity is going to make a difference in whether or not I pursue that activity. That's just a real general example. Another example that might be um, closer to the idea of the development over time is the idea of baking. So let's say I'm five years old and I'm learning to bake. I'm going to have a different idea of what baking should be. Uh, at that point in time than I do now at the age that I am now. How my ability to bake developed has a lot to do with the home I grew up in, the fact that my mother did a lot of baking and that I did a lot of hanging out with her when I was a little kid. So I constructed the idea of myself in context. Now how I bake and the things that I put in my kitchen um, are a reflection of that identity that I have. So I'm affecting my environment in constructing my kitchen in a certain way, and I am affected by my environment, in particular the social environment in which I grew up, in order to become a baker. So transactional contextualism, more long-term, being affected by and having an effect on your own environment. Now, environmental press. This one is a little more short-term. Okay, this is more like in the moment, how you're feeling about how things are going on. So this definition is different environments force different behaviors and your sense of competence is affected. So let's talk about the difference in your dining experience if you're at a fast food restaurant versus a fancy restaurant with linen tablecloths and fancy linen napkins and, and uh, you know, people waiting on you with towels over their arms. What's your sense of competence like when you're in a McDonald's restaurant? Do you feel pretty competent? How about if you're in a fancy restaurant with lots of forks, knives, and spoons, and uh, you don't know what that little dish on the side is for, and uh, maybe you, you modulate your tone of voice, and again, it might Im impact your sense of competence. The perfect example of environmental press is Princess Diaries because we think of the young princess Mina who didn't know that she was a princess and who grew up like a normal teenager in San Francisco at the age of 15 gets visited by this absent grandmother and told that she is a princess and all of a sudden she has to take princess lessons and she has to decide whether she's going to enter into this royal role and the reason why it's funny is because she feels so much environmental press she's out of context all the time throughout the movie and she's doing things that don't fit the context that she's in and it's those surprising things that we then think are funny so if you want to think of princess diaries when you think of environmental press that might help you remember the definition it's more situational so let's talk a little bit about these person environment interactions which is what this whole model is about in a way, this is very similar to the complex systems theory that model of human occupation uses, but the images may be a little bit different. So um, in model of human occupation, there, there are more lines and arrows that make us think in linear processes, even though it's trying to demonstrate to us a nonlinear or a, a, a complex uh, system, um, systems view. In this particular model, it's this constant interchange. It's constantly going on. It's more like a piece of dandelion fluff. And the interesting thing about it is that it is self-organizing. So a dandelion fluff may not look very organized just to, to look at it kind of floating around. But if you look at it closely, it's very intricate and it has organized itself very well. Well, how does this relate to social justice? Because I've alluded to the fact that we're going to be talking about population health, population interventions, especially when it comes to the environment. Well, this model looks at how built environments might, environments might limit people's occupational performance. 
And a quote from our textbook that I really like said that all people with varying abilities have a right to be included in all aspects of society. So these are what occupational therapists work to change. They want to empower individuals for their own self-determination, but we also want to be advocates for our patients, advocates for people with disabilities, and advocates for universal design so that anybody can partake in the systems that are being created for folks. If you wanna have a little fun, grab yourselves some M&Ms and some string, and we're gonna use them to represent the dynamic nature of this particular model. So this is one view of the model with the performance range. This picture was not in our textbook, but it is the illustration in the original article about EHP. And the black kind of uh, swoop that's inside of the context there with the person is the person looking through their context, using their skills and abilities at the performance range that is available to them. So that's just considering what a performance range is. Now, if you made it with your M&Ms, it might look something like this. So I have a little green M&Ms as the person, a bunch of red M&Ms to be the skills and abilities surrounded by more red M&Ms, which was context. Can you tell this was at Christmas when I first did this and, and we have Christmas M&Ms. And then we have a set of tasks, some of which are within the person's performance range and some of which are outside the person's performance range. And the person considers what's available to them and what is not available to them based on skills and abilities and context. So let's move on and consider those roles. And in the example by the authors, it's looking at the overlap between the roles of wife, mother, and cook. So let's say maybe driving is an aspect of both being a, a wife and mother, um, which um, I know this was the 90s, but uh, you know can also include work roles, I think. Uh, but let's just say for the sake of argument that, that the, the um, wife and mother is driving, uh, and that might be part of the wife role because they're running errands to manage the home, but also the mother role because they're driving to take the kids to preschool. Uh, and then the cook role, well, everybody likes to eat, so cooking is a good aspect uh, to be ready for eating, but it's also important to cook nutritious meals for those toddlers at home. So there could be some overlap between mother and cook roles as well. So this is an example of our roles. And if you did it with your M&Ms, what might it look like? Well, mine looked like this. I didn't create the overlap, uh, which is okay. Uh, it's just considering that there are these subsets of tasks, and one of the things that we as occupational therapists do is to break down people's tasks into the, the clumps of things that they need to be able to do in order to carry out their various occupations, or in this case, the terms of this model, in order to carry out their roles. So that's our occupational act or activity analysis, breaking those down. Okay, so here's a person with a diminished performance range. And their performance range is diminished, not because the context in this case is diminished, it's a typical context, but they have a reduced number of skills and abilities. So this could be someone who's living um, with typical physical abilities in a typical home who somehow, due to an illness or injury, loses physical abilities. All of a sudden, things that had been in their performance range before are now outside of their performance range. So we could take the example of spinal cord injuries. Uh, if someone lived in a split level home but had a spinal cord injury, all of a sudden they're not able to go to all the levels of their home. And that's gonna severely limit their ability to carry out the tasks that they wanna do. And this is what it might look like with my M&Ms. So I have reduced my skills and abilities and my performance range is reduced as well. Again, with the M&Ms, trying to illustrate the dynamic nature of this model. It's not a static model. It changes according to what's going on with the person. Okay, so here's another view. We have a person who has the same skills and abilities and the context is reduced. So let's say it's the same person uh, that's had the spinal cord injury, but now they're several years on and their home has been remodeled to, to where they need it to be, and they've gotten pretty 
oriented to their own physical abilities. They've made some adjustments, but now they're in a new environment. So let's say they want to go to college and they try to go to college and the buildings don't have ramps and uh, there are not elevators that are accessible or let's say the elevator is way around back on the back side of the building instead of um, in a more convenient place. Um, that is going to reduce the performance range, even though the person's skills and abilities have not changed. They may need some occupational therapy intervention to address the context changes that have caused their performance range to be reduced. And here's what it might look like uh, if you're using your M&Ms. So the person has the typical number of skills and abilities that they had previously, but all of a sudden, the context is squeezing them. It's, it's reduced around them, and that reduces the performance range. Now, what are we going to do about this? So how can an occupational therapist address that performance range to make it bigger? Okay. Um, the things that we know that we can address are the person's skills and abilities and the person's context. And we can also address the task itself. How can we bring that task itself more into that performance range? So this particular model has five intervention approaches, which are almost perfectly analogous to those in the OTPF, okay? The um, Occupational Therapy for Practice Framework. Four, okay, so we're on the fourth one now. Um, so we're going to take a look at each of these in turn and look at how it compares to the OT practice framework as well. So the first is establish and restore. And the focus in this particular intervention is on the person. So we're trying to establish or regain skills and abilities that the person um, either they didn't have before or they did have and then they lost them. So in this particular case, we don't know exactly what's going on, but there's someone playing a guitar with this little girl who's got the xylophone on her bed and they're doing an intervention. So maybe they're trying to reestablish her endurance or maybe they're actually trying to uh, establish a new musical skill for her. Um, but there is establish or restore is what can be going on for her. So where can you find this in OTPF4? It's in table 13 and it's literally termed Intervention Approaches is the name of the table, and it's Establish Restore with the subtitles Remediation and Restoration. I recommend you look it up. The second intervention approach is Alter, and this focuses on the context. Now, this is one that people struggle with sometimes, but this is changing to a completely new context. This doesn't mean alter a context that the person currently has. It means put them in a brand new context. There's no specific match for this in the OT practice framework. Uh, the closest you can come is that it might uh, border on create, um, has to do with that as well. But so altering would be meaning putting someone, having someone move from an inaccessible home to an accessible home that works for, uh, for them. It might mean that a child who does not function well in a typical classroom gets put in a classroom for students that match the abilities that that student has. So this is when you need to completely change the context in order for the person to be functional. If we only need to adapt where the person is at, then we can use adapt modify. So this would be if we're adapting the home the person already has, like adding grab bars and a toilet safety frame to the bathroom, or having a quiet space within a typical classroom for a child who might struggle with sensory issues um, so that they can still be in the typical classroom but have um, some adaptations. Or sitting a child on a yoga ball who's in a typical classroom. We've adapted and we've modified. Now I've got some pictures of some environmental modifications here because I thought they were kind of cool and they don't have to be ugly. We can make things that are pretty and it means changing the existing environment. So OTPF4 table 13, this is modify with the subwords compensate or adapt. How about prevention? So this is focused on the client, the context, or the activity. It's all depending on what it is. 
So what we're trying to do is prevent the development of performance problems. So this is where a lot of our ergonomics and um, prevention of cumulative trauma injuries comes in. We're trying to prevent these injuries by creating a workstation that isn't going to harm the person over time. But we're also going to change the person because we're going to instruct them in habits um, that they can do to improve uh, their likelihood of not getting injured, such as teaching them stretches and teaching them breaks and, uh, and things like that. And for older adults and fall prevention, we might be changing the person by giving them um, some exercises to do, like this Tai Chi class. We also might be modifying the environment with better lighting or better um, color discrepancies, uh, you know, like stripping the stairs um, so that people can, can see the contrast a little bit better. So this can be any number of things. And the interesting thing is you can see how it would overlap with ADAPT because if I'm putting up grab bars and handrails on someone's stairs, I'm also adapting and modifying, but I'm preventing falls. So yes, there can be some overlap between these different intervention areas. And five is create. Again, this one is completely different from um, what we're talking about when we're talking about like adapting and modifying. This isn't about creating, um, you know, a grab bar. That's not creating. That's adapting and modifying. Creating is where we provide access for all. Okay, so this is our universal design. So this is where we're considering the context in the um, aspect of how it's relating to populations. So it could be a specific population, such as wheelchair users, or it could be for the entire population and making sure it's accessible for all. Again, this relates directly to the definition for CREATE that's in the OT Practice Framework 4. And in fact, they cite this very article by Dunn, Brown, and McGuigan, um, as for their definition for create. So a couple of examples, you can create an adapted playground that's accessible for all, that includes visual cues for low vision folks, uh, braille for no vision folks, and auditory cues for no vision folks, um, and uh, you know the, the access for the wheelchair users as well. And I included the picture of the mailbox to tell you a story about the time I had a client who lived in a senior community but the mailboxes were down on the corner in one of those shared boxes that has like 16 different mailboxes in it. And the only thing keeping her from going home is that she couldn't go out to get her mail. She had arranged for her groceries, for everything, but she didn't have anybody who could pick up her mail on a daily basis. So I advocated for her with the postal service to get a mailbox put right outside her door so that uh, she could have her mail delivered directly to her. And it's those sorts of advocacy things that occupational therapists can do to create new systems, new ways of doing things, that if we just think about it, we create access for all, not just for that one individual. So ecology of human performance relates directly to population health in many ways. We can think about it in terms of mental health. We can think about it in terms of vision and hearing and wheelchair users and other physical disabilities that people have. So we're going to be spending some time during lab exploring how we might create population level interventions and use theory from the ecology of human performance to guide us. Thanks, and I'll see you soon. Thank <laughs> you.